oh, I can kick hard. Like, I'm a dancer, like, and I'm not afraid. I'll kick that pad. And they were like, you can kick it so much harder. Why are you holding back? Hey there, how's it going? You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 632, with my guest today, Danielle Bergio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host and founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more, if you want to go deeper, see all the stuff we got going on, start at whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find everything we're doing. Links, products, services, you name it, it's there. And one of the things over there is our store. It's part of the way that we monetize. What are you going to find in there? Shirts and hats and apparel, as well as a constantly shifting inventory of protective equipment, uniforms, and other training accessories. So check that out. Use the code PODCAST15. It's going to get 15% off anything you find in the store. The website for this show is completely separate. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week with the purpose being connecting you, educating you, and of course, entertaining you, the traditional martial artist. So if that means something to you, if you find value in that, consider helping us out. There are a bunch of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, share an episode, you could follow us on social media. Of course, you could tell people about us. That's a really important part. Grab a book from Amazon. We're adding more all the time. You could also leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts, or you could support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. Place to go for that. You can get in for as little as $2 a month. At $5, you get exclusive audio episodes. $10 gets you bonus video. $25 gets you book and program drafts, and it goes up from there. If you want exclusive one-on-one time with me, well, you can get that too. You want me to train you? You can get that too. So check it out, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Now you may not recognize today's guest by name, at least not at first, but I will guarantee you recognize a good deal of her work. I'm not going to spoil it. You may have read ahead, you may have Googled or something, but this woman has been involved in some really amazing martial arts projects. And that's why she's on the show talking to me today. And you get to listen to that conversation. Had a great time. We get to learn all about her, her life, her unconventional start, her appreciation for the arts, and so much more. So let's do it. I'm so excited you have a picture of your dog. Ah. <laughs> That's Ripley. <laughs> you, you have an immensely photogenic dog. Thank you. She is. She really is a little supermodel. <laughs> yeah, I, my, my cat is the same way. She is, honestly, it could be any day now. She's 21 and a half. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be the worst lighting. I can pretty much hold the phone in the opposite direction and it still comes out as this phenomenal shot that, you know, I post on social media. People are like, Aww. how is your cat? This is amazing. Yeah. She's adorable. <laughs> she's adorable. What's so, her name? Zuza. Oh, that's a good name. Zuza. I, I can't take credit for it. She, uh, you know, one of those uh, stuck around after a relationship. Got it. <laughs> sort of deals. Sort of deals. But Ripley. Wow. Ripley, yeah. Dog. My, co- I, I love, my COVID baby. She's my COVID puppy. Oh, I, she didn't look that young. Yeah, she's a, actually in that photo, I think she's nine months. Okay. Yeah, and now she's a year and a half. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Was, was COVID boring and, and you said, you know, I need the chaos of a, of a puppy? Um. Yeah, I'm not going to say it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I had a, I had a quite a, quite a lot personally going on right before Mm. COVID hit. And I was like, the last thing I was planning on doing was getting a dog. My previous dog had actually passed just weeks before COVID hit. And I was definitely not getting another dog. Um, and then COVID hit and it was like, I sort of found myself alone and in, in more than right. Also, this is, odd. let's just get super personal. I, yeah, I hey. my husband and I split right before the pandemic mm. and then the dog died and then the pandemic hit oh. and then all my friends and family and therapists was like, maybe you should get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm not getting a dog because that's crazy. Um, and then I got a dog. But then you got a dog. So yeah, I mean, I met her. I just sort of opened my mind to the idea, and literally, yeah. she pretty much just appeared. And it was like, um, I'm madly now in love you, with this dog. Now you can't say no. Yeah. And thank God I had her. I mean, you know, at that time, I think we were all convinced the pandemic was going to last. Uh, some people ta- thought two weeks. And I remember I was <laughs> saying, this is going to go on for at least like two months, people. <laughs> and they were like mad at me. Uh, and then we were all surprised that you know. 
it went on as long as it did. So anyway, thank God I had Ripley because she was the best companion and um, having puppy energy and training her and working with her and doing all that has been really great. Well, I I checked out your Instagram before we did this and she was all over your Instagram and I was like, oh, a dog owner. I a love, dog lover. I, I, a lover, yes. Yeah. I'm, I, a, I'm an animal lover in general, not just dogs. Nice. I just love animals, but um, she's the closest thing I can have to a wolf. So that's mm. <laughs> very okay. I see. Yeah. I actually, I rank uh, or I rate the quality of my days by how many dogs I get to interact with. Oh, I like that. That's a good barometer. You know, two, three, four dog day, you know, back when I, <laughs> when I did IT at the, at the Humane Society you know, 10, 12, oh, 15 dog days. Those were good days. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, this can either be, it, you know, we, we have a, a decision to make right here. We either keep going and keep talking, or if we need some sidebar, some parameters, some whatever answer questions kind of thing, you know, we can, we'll edit this part out. Yeah. Up whatever you, you uh, whatever you choose. Let's I'm, keep going. Cause I'm a pretty listeners... open book. I'll talk Good. about anything. So, Good. and it, you know, it's, it's pre-recorded. So, you know, I mean, you're no stranger to having things edited and doing, doing shots over and over again, I'm sure. But you know, if we, if we need any of that, we can certainly do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I trust you. If I, if I say anything that I go oh, retract that, then I'll, <laughs> I'll let you know. Sounds good. <laughs> but otherwise I, I don't have much to hide. Okay. This, I, I don't know, is this your first martial arts specific show that you've been on? It is. Okay. Well, thank you. You know, we, we had, we had some discussion internally, you know, and, and I, I'm an open book too. You know, when, when the opportunity to talk to you was presented, it was, okay, how do we tackle this from a martial arts perspective? Because we're a martial arts show and we have to be true to our audience and our, and our mission and in furthering the arts. And then. I got to look at the work that you'd done. And I went, oh, there's our connection. I mean, this is, this is obvious. This is, this is so obvious. Some of the things that you've worked on and honestly, people you've worked alongside who have been on this show. Yes, absolutely. I have had a connection to the martial arts community, uh, quite a strong connection to the martial yeah. arts community. And I should say, I mean, I think this is the first time and definitely the first time in a long time, but back in the day when I had just finished doing matrix, um, I did do a couple of uh, like magazines, uh, a couple of martial arts magazines and things like that. So, but that I was really heavy in that world at that nice. time, which is not, you know, not really my world that I necessarily grew up in or, sure. but I, but it's been a big part of my life. The community has been a big part of my life. Um, and the teachings have become a big part of my life, even mm. though I, I haven't followed the traditional steps that most people would. And that's okay. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names, but it doesn't take a lot of research to realize that some of the people that we in our world in in the martial arts world lift up as these are amazing martial arts actor celebrities actually are, are closer to your path than mine, where they train on set and it becomes a a movement discipline. And then from there, some of them will, will go off and become a little bit more traditional in their approach. But some of them don't. Right. Yeah. It's two, two different worlds that overlap and there's, Mm. there's that intersection, I think. Um, and I'm probably on the outside of that intersection, (laughs) but there is that intersection where, uh, people that are heavily in, you know, real true martial artists and also are, uh, actors, stunt people, Mm. you know, um, do it on screen. I should say, bring that art to the screen. Um, so yeah. And then yeah. obviously that's where I live. So. No, when I, when I take a look, you, you name dropped, you dropped a movie that, that actually quite a few people in our world think of as pretty legitimate and, and even, uh, genre advancing martial arts film, the matrix, but yes, you were in, were you in the first one? I was not in the first okay. one. I actually was just, uh, when I saw the first one sitting in that theater, like everyone else going, what is up there on <laughs> that screen? Wow. Yeah. I want to be Trinity. Um, uh, I had not, I had been thinking about getting into the stunt work, but I had not actually done it. And I think that movie actually was a big push for me to say, Oh, I, there's something that I want to do. Um, and then I worked on the sequels, the second and third. You you went from seeing the first one in the theater, like the rest of us, yes. not being involved in martial arts or stunts or film 
to... I think at that point I was in the film industry working. Okay. I, I had started as a dancer and an actor. I think at that point I had been just starting to learn some martial arts and working with some stunt people who were encouraging me that okay. path because they were like, from your dance skills, you would pick this up really well and this would be a good avenue for you. We need more people like you that can do all these different things. And uh, I picked it up quickly. So it was very early on my path, but I had not yet, um, I had not yet worked as a stunt person. Okay. So to, to, to reframe the, the shocked statement I'm about to make, you went from in a few years, seeing the movie to in the second movie, doubling one of the main characters. That's correct. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. It is kind of crazy. And you know, this is the point where if it was a new movie coming out, people would be listening to this and they'd be going, well, Jeremy, you know, that doesn't mean that she was any good or anything. But I, I'm going to guess that we've all seen, just about all of us have seen all three Matrix, Matrix movies. And while there are plenty of things that people will point at and criticize, it's never the stunts. It's never that work. Right. Wow. It was a, it was a very special project to be a part of. and. um and I have to say that, you know, the majority of what people see on screen in the Matrix franchise really is primarily actors. I mean, that, I can't even take credit for a lot of the great work that you did see up there because the directors were so adamant about training the actors um, and us all working together as a team to get the actors on that screen as much as possible. So... Um, a lot of that really actually was Carrie Ann, which is it, which is rare. You know, people, a lot of actors say they do their own stuff, but I think <laughs> we know that that's not actually true. Um, yeah. but, but in the matrix franchise, it is very true. So, it, I mean, I'm it, there, it, I, my work is on screen, but yeah. I gotta give, I gotta give props to Carrie Ann and she worked really hard. Oh, she, she's great. She's great. Any, anybody who's seen those films knows. And if you haven't seen those films lately, audience, you know, go back, go back and check them out again. I want to go back though, you know, okay. on this show, we typically go through people's journeys, you know, your, your journey is different, but you mentioned dance. Yes. And anybody who's spent any time, you know, in even mid-level dance and martial arts knows that there's a fair amount of similarity in the way classes are presented, the intensity. Um, when I have to describe a martial arts form, you know, in, what in karate is called a kata or maybe it's called a pumse or a pattern. I describe it to people who don't know martial arts is, well, it's, it's kind of like a prearranged dance, you know, it's like some choreography and they're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. I can wrap my head around that. What was your dance background? So I started, um, you know, I started young, just doing a little bit of everything, right. A little tap, a little jazz, a little ballet. And then as I got older, I got a little more into musical theater. That's how my career started. I was on Broadway in New York. Um, and that seemed to be a good place for me. I really have a personal love for modern dance, contemporary dance, um, which is much more similar probably to a, a looser ballet. Like it's, it's much more disciplined in that way, which I think has the similarity uh, with martial arts, like that high level of discipline. Um, so that was sort of a place that I, I kind of loved to be. But most of my career was in musical theater but a little, a little bit of everything. So I've always had to kind of adapt my style to whatever was required, which is, I think, what helped me so much when I did switch over into stunts and started doing more fight choreography as opposed to dance choreography. It's a very like monkey see, monkey do mentality. Let me see if I can shift and change my body to the style that's required. Mm. So I think that was one of my strengths. Where where did that desire to shift and change come from? Most people don't end up doing something well and then say, you know, I'm going to throw this out or at least put it aside and try to do this other thing over here that I don't know how to do. And then when I get done with that, I'm going to do this other thing, this other thing, this other thing. And you just went through a bunch of different kinds of dance. <laughs> yeah. And one might assume, okay, well, I'm going to go do dance. I'm going to be a dance instructor or I'm going to do dance choreography on sets, right? There are so many places you could have taken that, but that's wasn't where you, you cut it off. So why? That is a very good question. Um, I think it's just my personality is very, um, 
oh, I'm always looking for the next, you know, the next challenge, the next, I just want to keep learning and growing and shifting and changing and moving. And um, I felt like I had had my success in this, in the dance world. And there was something that I, I never felt that feeling of like, yes, I've done it. I've achieved my dreams and I'm done now. Um, there, there's always that what's next for me. So I actually moved to Los Angeles from New York because I was really in the dance community deeply in New York. And I wanted to actually shift towards acting. You know, I was really looking to go more into, I got a taste of doing some film and commercial and TV in New York. And I thought, this is what I really want to do. Um, so I wanted to move to LA where at that time, that's really where the work was. And I felt like I needed to meet a whole new group of people because New York felt like they, New York knew me as a dancer. Um, so I moved to LA and wanted to pursue being an actor. And that's when I was introduced to some martial arts community and some of the action actor community. And I went, Hmm, that there was something that just really enticed me. And they encouraged me to start learning some martial arts, which I had never done. And I just loved it. Like my body loved it and my mind loved it. And it just felt like something I wanted to go after. Um, and so I kind of, I dove in. I think there was a part of me that was done being a dancer. Um, so, and the fact that Explain nobody that. was offering my, my own TV series or movie at that time, you know, yeah. um, I was ready I was ready to just, uh, I felt like it was something I had done as a dancer and I, right. and I did it for a good number of years and had success. And it was like, okay, well, is this, is this all there is? Like I was, yes, I was on Broadway, but I was in the chorus. Um, I just, I don't know. I wanted, I wanted more. more. You took it as far as you felt you could have. Yeah. And it yeah. was time to make space for something else. I get that. Yeah. And there was just a, there was a pull towards the film industry. There was a pull towards, you know, it started, it started with martial arts before it actually became stunt work. Oh. So in the beginning, it was the martial arts that really drew me in. And I loved it. I loved how it felt in my body. And I remember, I remember thinking like, I've always been a pretty confident, strong person. But when I started doing martial arts, I remember the day that they were like, okay, kick this pad. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll kick it. They were like, no, no, kick it as hard as you can. And I was like, oh, I can kick hard. Like, I'm a dancer, like, and I'm not afraid. I'll kick that pad. And they were like, you can kick it so much harder. Why are you holding back? And I was, I was getting frustrated and more and more frustrated. And then when I realized the power that I actually had, that I thought I knew I had, but I didn't experience it until I kicked that pad. And they showed me how to really kick it as hard as I really could and how to kind of kick through it. Something, I got very excited. <laughs> I was mm. like, wow, I felt like I, I tapped into some kind of power. I unleashed something. And I realized that I did have a lot of power inside of me that I wasn't necessarily accessing. Mm. And that was really um, addictive. Sure. Sure. There. there if I was a, a therapist and longtime listeners know that sometimes we have episodes, actually I recorded one earlier today where it kind of had a little bit of a, a therapy bent, but if I was wearing that sort of a hat, you know, we, we could poke at it and say, you know, was there something from your childhood or whatever, where, you know, you were craving that? Absolutely. Yes. I will. I, I'm always happy to go down the therapy hole. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I mean, I think all, all of that's connected, but I, I also believe that all of us have that inside of us where I, I think the majority of people in the world do not recognize how powerful we really are and stepping into the, getting the opportunity to step into that power and having somebody mentor you towards that. And that's what I think martial arts is so wonderful. At. And I encourage every one of my friends that have kids, I always tell them, if you do one thing, please get your kids into you know, some form of martial arts so they can learn that, you know, and dis there's so many good things to learn from it and discipline and body movement and being in touch with your body and, um, and all of that and, co and the confidence that it gives you, which it's funny to me because obviously it, people think of it as like a fight form. So you're learning to fight, but in reality, I think it makes you a much more peaceful person and a person that is much less to engage in a fight.
mm. ironically, as it circles. Yeah, in. yeah. Actually, in a uh, episode we recorded earlier, it'll come out uh, probably about three to four weeks before this one airs. We talked about that very subject. This idea that martial arts, the, the, the irony of learning to fight and defend yourself, makes you a more peaceful person. Yeah, and it seems so contradictory. Yeah, but it's so true. So all of that kind of happened. And um, I think that's what, you know, to sort of set me off on my new path. Mm. I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of martial artists. And, and some of those people that I've had the chance to work with were pretty early in their martial arts career. And a lot of them come in with some other form of physical discipline, yoga. Some come in with, you know, a, a combative like boxing, mm -hmm. you came in with the dance. And sometimes those movement patterns can be really a hindrance because your body's used to moving in certain ways. You talked about hitting the pads. And I would imagine that some of the adjustment they made for you hitting those pad pads was based in changing what you were doing as a dancer that might, quote unquote, kick to a martial artist kicking. Absolutely. Yes. And I had so many habits yeah. as a dancer <laughs> that once I crossed over, I, it was really hard to break certain habits. Now, you know, other aspects, like you said, like choreography and things like that, that was like, oh, this is like second nature to me. But then there, are, you know, years and years of training my body to hold a beautiful line and to point my toe and to never turn my hip over. Like you always have your hip turned out as a dancer you very rarely like turn the hip over. That was, you know, really challenging for me to wrap my mind around that I needed to like, you know, adjust the position of my hip in order to do a proper kick um, or to, you know, not make things look so pretty, especially when it came to choreography on camera. That Those were some pretty big challenges. I probably, probably still have, you know, I have people like Jeff Amata in my head always. <laughs> like, <laughs> Stop making it look so pretty. <laughs> Um, yeah. Mm, I get that. Now, if we were to watch your choreography, we were to cut it all out and, and string it together chronologically, maybe, or not necessarily, but we just connect with what you've done on camera with fight scenes. Is there is there a scene or a film that you are most proud of that you felt like you we're able to best represent the intentions of the choreography, the director, the story. Um, to be honest, nothing, nothing comes to mind to say, you know, yes, yes, this one, because again, like something like the matrix, you'd go, Oh, you know, yeah, but she was in the matrix. And I go, yeah, but Carrie Ann did so much of that. And there were just little bits and pieces of me here and there. And of course, yes, I'm very proud of that. But there's not like one fight sequence that I can point to and say that one. Um, and a lot of other things I've done, like I did a great rooftop fight uh, when I doubled the electric character in the Daredevil movie. Uh, a lot of that was just kind of getting tossed around. So not necessarily martial arts. My bigger fight scenes that I've done probably like that fully play out. That's all me. We're on a lot of lower budget films and things like that. So that's okay. It, yeah. If there's if there's one group of people that loves their low budget films, <laughs> it's us. Yes. I mean, really think about it. if we were to go back and actually we early on in the history of this show, we asked I asked most of the guests for their favorite martial arts films. And most of them were bad ones, yeah. low budget ones. And even, <laughs> even the first ones, you, you go back, you watch Billy Jack or, you know, I'm going to commit heresy now, Enter the Dragon. You know, <laughs> these are not great movies, but they're great movies. Right. So can, when, when you think about some of these, these films that you were on that, you know, the audience may not know about, you know, give, give us some names. I, I bet some of the people out there will have seen them. Oh, I, honestly, like th the couple of ones that come to mind are ones that I don't want anyone to watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's new. They're just that, bad. That is but a new response say, to those questions. I'm like, there's one movie out there in particular that I'm like, I just, please, nobody ever watch it. Um, 
but again, like I got to, I got to fight Boz Rutan in that movie, which was really cool. You know, oh, nice. who's such a sweetheart. And I mean, you know, only in, only in a, only on a movie could I actually knock him out. Um, <laughs> I did a lot, uh, I think a lot of fun that I had doing martial arts. Actually, there was an old TV series called Birds of Prey and I doubled, uh, I was one of the doubles for the main character on that, who was like the kind of, I forgot her name on it was like the cat woman character. Mm. She had like two or three main doubles and I would come in and I did a lot of fight choreography on that series, which was fun. Cause I, you know, we really, we got to dive in and I had, there was such a great team of people, uh, martial artists and stunt people that were really talented. And so, you know, fighting seven guys at once kind of thing with, you know, just lightning speed choreography and, um, with a little bit of a super er hero angle, you know, you can really take things to another level. So I think a lot of that was, uh, probably some of the stuff that I'm the most proud of. I think there's some of that. There's a, there's like, I have stunt reel out there somewhere and there's a, some clips from birds of prey on that. Nice. Nice. It's a, it's a TV series that I haven't seen. It's an old but one. <laughs> one that seems to have a, a bit of a, a cult following. Yeah, that was that was quite a few years ago, that show. 2000, what's it saying? Uh, 2002, 2003? Yeah, or, yeah. That's what I got? Early yeah. 2000. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. I'm dating myself. <laughs> Don't do hey, the math. <laughs> hey, none of, us are, none of us are getting younger and we're, we're not getting out of here alive. So I, I think that's quite okay. It's okay. You know what? I, I, I'm embracing my age these days. And I have to say that I, I feel in a lot of ways that I'm in the best shape of my entire life. What um, would you attribute that to? Um, I think as I've gotten older, I, it, I've made it such a priority. You know, I think when I was younger, I took a lot of things for granted. I could just mm. eat whatever I wanted and <laughs> not take the best care of myself and yeah. still, you know, seem to be okay. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten very serious about what it is I put not just in my body, but on my body and the way that I treat my body and wanting to stay strong. And especially after the years of, um, you know, getting knocked around and it's it, even being a dancer was pretty brutal on my body. Sure. Um, and then, you know, martial arts and stunts and all that, it, it takes a toll if you're not being good to yourself. So I've learned self-care. I've learned how to take good care of myself and I've taken it very seriously. So um, I attribute it to that. Mm. We've had a number of stunt performers on. A lot of them follow a, a more traditional, they get involved in martial arts, want to turn it into a job, wake up and realize that there aren't very many options. Uh, at least conventionally, you know, plenty of people have done weird things to turn martial arts into a job. You know, what, what I do here is a good example of that. <laughs> So we've heard these stories. We've heard about the abuse on the body. We've heard the physicality and the toll that it takes. Are you starting to look at roles and say, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if it's worth the consequences. Absolutely. I've, I've started, I've phased myself out of the stunt work a few years ago now. Uh, it's, it's been about five years since I've really taken like a, big stunt job and it's been uh a couple maybe three years since i just started saying no to all stunt work mm. now that being said i have some stunt coordinator friends who don't take no for an answer <laughs> so i have uh, you know taken a little job here and there where they're a little bit easier um but mostly because i'm again i'm in a new phase of my career where i want to transition I've done that. I had my success. Now I'm focused on what's next. Um, part of it was to protect my body, but a lot of it was just the long-term goal of protecting my body to sort of pivot my ambitions and direction into an area where I'm not hitting the ground as, as often. Yeah. Um, but that said, I'm still, uh, I'm still pursuing an acting career. So I tend to 
get looked at for roles that are physical. So I don't mind. I actually love the physicality of it. I just don't want to be doubling the actors anymore. I'll hit the ground as long as it's for myself now. Okay. That, that's a, so that's that's a sort sensible of the way line that to I'm, draw. Yeah. Because when you're doubling, you, you take a lot harder hits. You become a bit right. more disposable, you know. That's the word Somebody, I was going to use, but I thought it yeah. might be offensive. It's, it, it, you know what? It's not really because I think stunt performers know that that's, that's the gig, right? Like you're going to do something dangerous. Somebody might get hurt. They can't afford to hurt the actor. That's going to shut down production. So we'll bring you in and hopefully you won't get hurt. But if you do get hurt, you're replaceable. Right. It's part of, part of the job. Are there any stunt roles that you would say, you know what, I have to take this one? Is there something, is there, is there a film or an actress or a director that if they came calling, you would say, you know what, I know I've been saying no, but I, I've got to do this? Well, funny enough, <laughs> right, after, <laughs> right after I said, okay, this is it, I'm, I'm going to say no. On this date, it was like a certain birthday. I said, on this date, I'm going to say no. And I swear, like a week later, someone called and said, we're looking for a double. They were doing the new Terminator and they wanted a double for Linda Hamilton. Um, and, you know, it's a big film. Again, an iconic role. It was everything I wanted to do. And I really had to think about it. And I was like, if anything was going to pull me back, it was going to be that. And I said, no. And wow. it's not like they were offering me the job. They were, they really were wanting me to audition for it and, and to throw my name in the hat to be considered. So not to say that I would have gotten it, but, um, I was like, okay, here's my big test. What am I going to say? Mm. And, uh, I said, no, I'm committing so, no. to my plan. So yeah, luckily nothing else has come along to tempt me that much, <laughs> 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 but I think my answer would be no. Yeah. Right. Now, as you move ahead and the, let's, let's say the, the heart of what brought you into martial arts stunts has faded out. What is your connection with martial arts like now? Well, I honestly, it would be a dream come true if I could do a movie and get to do my own martial arts on camera. That would be, uh, that would be the ultimate dream. I would still... I still love it. I still, um, it still feels good in my body. Although I have, you know, since the pandemic and all of that happened as well, I'm not, I haven't been in the gym and training and sort of lost touch with some of those people that I used to do that with. I have a dance studio in the back of my, my house here that I built during the pandemic because I was missing so much being able to, you know, work my body the way I wanted to. So I've kind of lately I've, I've circled back to the dance, which is interesting because hmm. for almost 20 years, I didn't dance at all. I was fully just on the other side of it. And all my training was martial arts. Um, so I've circled back around, but I would, I would love an opportunity and a reason to dive back in and get my body moving again in that way. Cause it, it is, it does feel really, really good to me. Let's talk about that return to dance because we have people who come to the show and you know they they trained as a kid or they stopped training when they had kids you know for whatever reason they have to set martial arts down for a time and then something happens you know a year five years 20 years sometimes more later and they pick it up again and i i hear all different responses you know guilt and and uh this was a part of my life that was missing and, and, you know, anything in between that you could imagine. What was it like to pick up dance again? Yeah, it was, it was scary in the beginning. And I thought, Oh, am I too old to be doing this? You know, can my body still do this? Frustrating because my mind knows what to do, but my body was not cooperating. Um, but then slowly, but surely things started coming back online and the muscle memory started kicking in and, the, you know, and I, I had to, I had to work for it, but it all came back. And that's when I can say, now I actually feel stronger than I was in my twenties. Mm. 
Um, I think cause I had to work so much harder at it to bring it back, but it, it felt really good. It felt like home. Um, and I thought, wow, I, I, it was one of those things like you don't really miss it. You didn't realize that you missed it until it came back. And then I went, wow, that's actually been really missing from my life. What does your dance practice look like now? Is it something you're doing frequently? I'm getting, I'm getting more frequent about it. In the beginning, I built the dance studio and I thought, okay, now what do I do? You know, <laughs> the, the Zoom classes were really frustrating because like the sound was never right. And what I love about being in dance class is that is the energy of the other people and then being pushed. Mm-hmm. When I, when I went back to dance, I found myself into a professional, uh, like a level three professional class, which was full of 20 year olds that were at the top of their game. And I was like, okay, wow, this is <laughs> really humbling. And, um, it was great because that energy pushed me to, you know, want to keep up. And then you've got, uh, people watching you, you know, cause you usually do it. Like you'll learn the choreo, you'll do warm up, you'll do the choreography, and then you'll do it in groups. And it, everyone's watching you. So you're, you're pushed to do your best. And I find on a zoom class, that's really missing, sorely missing. And even though I have a nice space in my back, it's not as large as going to a professional dance studio. So that was a bit challenging and frustrating. And I had to work my way past that and kind of find my way. So, um, luckily I do have that same teacher that was the level three class is still occasionally teaching on zoom. So that's nice. I can do her class and get my basics in because you know, there's, there's all the, like the drills at the Mm -hmm. beginning, the whole warm up, where, you know, you do your tendus and your plies and your, all the things that you do, um, to stay strong and get centered and grounded and warmed up. And then you get to flow and with the choreography and have some fun. So I still have that structure, but then on my own, I started, uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do in the beginning. I, I started just putting on the music. I have a, a hoop, a dance hoop. And so mm-hmm. I started actually putting on music and dance hooping just to get my body moving and energy like on my own without anybody there telling me what I needed to do. I had to take on the responsibility of doing it for myself. And it felt a bit awkward in the beginning. And then slowly but surely, I let the music play and start to just lose myself in the music and get into my body and start, you know, putting my body into more and more challenging positions where I have to really uh, use my core strength and my flexibility and my everything to move, but then just sort of organically, like kind of let it flow. So that's what I've been doing, a little combination of some classes here and there, and then me um, really being free and letting that explosive energy fly out of my body, let you know, let my body just move and explore and do crazy things. Mm. And that feels good because I haven't, I didn't move my body a whole lot during the beginning part of the pandemic. You're, you're not alone. Yeah. It you're was really challenging alone, but... to, yeah. to try to find that outlet. Really challenging. When you talk about that explosive energy with dance, I'm I'm wondering, did the last 20 years where, where you set dance down and, you know, you were picking up martial arts and, and doing stunt work. Has that had any kind of an influence on your freeform movement? Huge, huge, because I don't think I understood that explosive energy part when I was a dancer pre, uh, prior to learning martial arts. And and now that's something that I think it's, it's so important for dancers to embody. There's times where it's, things are soft and slower. And then at times where, you know, that energy really does need to explode out of your body. That's something I definitely learned from martial arts that now I feel more in my personal movement and choreography and all of that. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Any, any new skills coming? If, if dance and, and all the various flavors there were a set of skills, you put them down, picked up martial arts for a while, in a sense you've put it down, at least in the 
in the movie implementation side of it, I don't get the sense that you slow down very often or much. <laughs> No. And and at the times that you do, uh, it is reluctantly. <laughs> so <true. laughs> what is the next physical challenge that you're picking up? So the challenge that I've been picking up lately is, is a less physical uh, and more mental. I've been moving into writing and producing. Hmm. So um, I have a, a feature film that I'm... I was actually so... Qu- we were literally in pre-production. Like no. we were going and everything just sort of recently fell apart. So hopefully sooner rather than later, that'll be back on track. Um, so it's very mental. So I've had to really root into my physical practice on my own because my physical practice has always been a part of my career. And now my career is more, you know, mental. Um, but I, I need that balance. Like I realize how important it is for me to be that physical. So um, so yeah, I'm still dancing, but, but the hooping thing actually is something that I've taken up now as just like a fun physical outlet. There's a lot of things you can do with a hoop and again, just the way moving around my body. And, um, so that's been, I, cause I do always need something new that's kind of stimulating me to get me going. So it's been a, a bit of, bit of hooping. And last week for the first time in years, I broke out my old roller skates. So my, <laughs> my Broadway show that I did was Starlight Express, which was a oh, show on roller skates. I still have my skates and uh, I actually broke them out uh, last week. And I thought, Hmm, maybe I'm gonna <laughs> learn how to like, cause I used to be able to trick, you know, I would spin and do all kinds of crazy stuff on the, on the quads, the four wheels, not the blades. I don't know how to do those. Um, so oh, I don't if, know. You, if you can do quad skates, you can do inline. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or the, the balance. I tried a couple times. I felt really weird. Really? Oh. Yeah. I, tr- I felt really I, weird. I found it so much easier. Ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm always looking for something to keep it new and fresh and exciting. Um, but maybe it might be, it might be time, especially after this chat, maybe I'm going to be inspired to circle back to some of my martial arts drills and, now that the world is opening back up again, uh, I've actually reconnected with a couple of friends who were the ones that really trained me in the beginning and really um, taught me. You know, when I first became a stunt woman, I was so lucky to find a group of guys out here in LA who are tremendous, so talented martial artists who really took me under their wing. And we would go, you know, several times a week, sometimes twice a day and train. Um, and they're still friends of mine and they still train all the time. So maybe you've inspired nice. me. Maybe I need to nice. go. Well, well, I hope so. I mean, that, <laughs> that is kind of our, our given mission here at Whistlekick is to encourage people to train. Yeah. So it, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't verbalize my encouragement. No, yeah, I think there, there's something here in me going, <laughs> hmm, yeah, maybe this is time to, to circle back, especially with all the frustrations I've been feeling with trying to get a movie off the ground. Um, hitting a bag actually sounds kind of good right now. Well, re- remember, martial arts films don't have to be very good. It's all about creative, <laughs> enjoyable choreography. So I could imagine you finding a way to use that hoop as a weapon and, and casting some interesting character, some crazy story where she has to fight through who knows, who knows what. Maybe, maybe, um, you know, maybe it can be a bigger part in, you know, Army of the Dead 2. Which yeah. we, we, didn't, we didn't even mention that, that you were in there <laughs> and you had, I, I, I have, when, when, when I dug in a little bit and found the character that you played, I went, okay, now I get the chance to ask, where did she get that gun? <laughs> Cause that was my, that was my response when I saw that scene was, where did she get that gun? That is not the gun that one would expect a soccer mom to have. Oh no. Oh no. She's a soccer mom with a vengeance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's she's on a mission to find her daughter and she's um yeah. Yeah, I think I love you know the opening sequence is um so for people that don't know I was the soccer mom and just it's I'm just in the title sequence of Army of the Dead and that that's it but um such a fun role to get to step into. And um, it, it was a fun movie. We we had the chance to talk to Sam Wynn before that. Ugh, aired, God, of course. I just, love uh, that woman. She's she, awesome. She's, She's so awesome. awesome. That was and that fight that was, uh, scene. Four sixty-two. Uh, yes, 
Wow. Yeah, she's she's as 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 B A as you get. She is a she really is. Killer. She's such a talented little powerhouse. I mean, phenomenally, ta- you know, beautiful. You've talked to her, so you know she's just like the sweetest thing yeah. on the planet. Um, and then yeah, a BA at the same time. Like she's she's so fierce and so sweet and a great actress. But wow, her physical skills are tremendous, tremendous. I've seen some of her footage from some of her tournaments and things like that. That girl is mm-hmm. just she can move. I'm so inspired by her. And so let's let's kind of wrap up with with a little bit of talk about movement. You know, we I, I have a firm belief when we talk about martial arts, one of the things that I'm, I'm quoted as saying is there are only so many ways that the human body can move and only so many of them make sense through the lens of combat. And, you know, if we take out that that other part, you know, whether you're talking about being on skates or using a hoop or any form of dance or any martial art or stunt work, whatever it is, you know, you can only move in so many different ways. Yeah. So if we have somebody listening right now who, you know, is is coming up through, you know, if they're listening to the show, they're probably a martial artist and they're looking ahead and they're saying, you know, maybe I want to get into stunt work or maybe I want to pursue dance or something else that is physical. Heck, maybe they have their their heart set on the Olympics. You've done a lot of different movement things, a lot of different movement disciplines. Mm hmm. If you had to offer some general advice for being successful in movement, because that that's the common thread here that we're talking about. What advice would you give to that person? Yeah. So Whatever. what I'm going to, yeah, what I'm going to say about movement is first of all, the most important thing is to just be so in touch with your body, right? There's a, mm. there's a connection between the mind and the body that um, has to be made. And I don't think everyone that that's not a natural thing for everyone. So for me, that's the most important thing, getting really like connected that, that money, money, body, mind, and spirit connection happening. Um, and then it's, it's just strengthening all of it, you know, and it's not just strengthening muscles, it's flexibility, agility, all of that. So to get your body in a place where it can do what your brain is asking it to do. That just takes a lot of discipline um, and a lot of practice. And so I would say just, it's about really committing and, and just training and training and training and training and training. I think anyone that I've ever talked to about success, it comes from just d- discipline and diligence and people see success, but they don't realize all the hard work that went into it. And it's loving the work too. You know, I think you have to find a place to work hard and be willing to work hard and then love that. And a lot of times there's a struggle that comes with that and you have to like love the struggle and embrace the struggle. And, um, yeah, but it, when it all comes together, it's so satisfying, so gratifying. And the body is like, I say all the time, the body is such an incredible tool like it is capable of doing again much more than people often believe of themselves you know just like i was saying earlier the power we have more power than we realize i think our bodies are capable of more than we realize and i think the people that are able to take their body to these extreme limits are people that recognize that and aren't afraid to work towards that Right did that on. make sense? Did I, it sure did. did I, answer that? I feel like I went on some weird tangent. Oh, that if, if you go back, if you listen to our show, that is exactly my job is to get people talking on, on tangents. People come back and say, did, did I answer your question? And the answer is usually no, but I don't care. Okay. <laughs> because my job is just to keep the guests talking because that's where the good stuff comes out. You know, this isn't, this isn't transactional. We don't have a script. We just kind of flow. Yeah. Let it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know you have a website, social media. You want to share that with the people listening? Yeah, I have a, a website, daniellebergio.com. Um, actually, there's a, I have a, a blog and a podcast page on there. So I uh, actually have a podcast where I interview uh, powerful women in oh, Hollywood. Cool. And I have had many martial artists on there. So Sam was mm. on there. I've had Amy Johnston is on there. And um, yeah, some, there's, some, there's some fun, great women on there. Um, yeah. What else? 
I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I think pretty easy to find. Daniel Bergio. I'm Danny Bergio 1111. But you know, I think if you type in my name. Why 1111? I have a, I have a real love for that number. Somebody actually took my name. So I couldn't oh, just be Daniel yes. Bergio. <laughs> Don't follow them. Um, yeah. And then 1111, it's, uh, I guess it's sort of a spiritual thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. I see the number a lot and I have a very strong spiritual practice and it always just kind of reminds me to um, stay connected to that part of myself. So mm. yeah, feels like a little magic number. It's time to close up. Okay. So let's pretend that you had just given some long, like a commencement speech sort of thing. And you know, you, you got you to end strong. You got to hit him with a good punch at the very end. You know, so what would your final words be to the listeners today? Just to say thank you for um, taking your time to listen to me rattle on. And um, but I hope that something I said would inspire you to step into your power and embrace your full potential. What a fun time. Danielle, thanks for coming on the show. Looking forward to the next thing that you do and, and checking that out as well. Folks, head on over to WhistlegeekMartialArtsRadio.com. We'll give you the links. We'll give you the photos, all the good stuff so you can stay up with Danielle and her career. And of course, while you're over there, check out the other episodes. Sign up for the newsletter. Stay involved. We are constantly refining and improving everything we do at Whistlecake, including the things for this show, because we want to serve you better. If you have feedback on that front, let me know, Jeremy at Whistlecake.com. And if you want to help us out, we've got a Patreon. We've got books on Amazon. We've got stuff at Whistlecake.com. You can buy so many options. But if you want the easy, free, and honestly, in some ways more impactful, tell your friends. Tell your martial arts friends about what we do and why we do it, because that's the number one way that we grow. And don't forget, we designed this incredible speed development program for martial arts. And you can do it at home. It doesn't take any equipment. You can grab it at whistlekickprograms.com. Our social media accounts are at Whistlekick, and we're constantly open to guest or topic suggestions for these episodes, so let us know. I appreciate you joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.